I'm Dr. Curtis Cornish, and I'd like to talk to you today about the auto-regulation of blood flow. Tissues do control their own blood flow, and we're going to talk about how they do that. To begin with, uh, I think it's important to understand that there are a lot of things that are involved in the control of blood flow, and here there are just a few of them that are in indicated. The important point is that all of them intersect at the perfusion of the tissues. So. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Long term, the tissues control their own blood flow. And we're going to talk about how, and I'll make this point again. So if we look at Ohm's Law, it says that pressure is equal to flow times resistance. So as you increase the perfusion pressure, we have an increase in the uh, flow. Now that's assuming that this is a fixed vessel that cannot dilate like a lead pipe. If we look at the same effect, again, pressure times flow, the Ohm's law stays the same. If we in increase our perfusion pressure, the flow goes up, but it's slightly different here because we are dealing with a vessel that can dilate and constrict. So this is the kind of thing that we would get, the relationship would get if we had a vessel that was uh, relaxed or totally dilated. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we had a vessel that was constricted, as we increase the pressure, the flow does not go up as much because the diameter is fixed or is uh, constricted. Now, in order to do these studies, the uh, individuals who investigated this had to have a, a system that allowed them to have a certain controlled pressure that was forcing the perfusate, and it was either blood or a lactated ringer solution or such, into the tissue. And this shows the heart that's being perfused, and they're measuring how much blood is coming out. And so they can change the pressure and the heart then changes resistance by dilating or constricting that then is changing the flow and so this is the kind of system that they would use now this shows a diagram of the kind of experiment that would they would do so we're looking here at pressure and the first thing we're going to do is to drop the pressure and hold it down and if you look at flow, then the flow goes down. So we start off at this point right here. And we drop the pressure, so we're going down on the pressure here. So the pressure's going down, and that's at this point, and the flow goes down. Now, as we allow the tissues to adjust, then the flow starts to come back up. And so we have moved back up to this point. Our pressure has still stayed the same but our flow has increased. Now if we bring the pressure back up, then the flow increases. Now that means that the vessel has dilated in order to bring us from point two to point three. Now the tissue sees too much blood flow and we're keeping the pressure constant, which is where we started, and our flow will gradually come back down. So the tissues are doing something to bring us back down. Now if we did this experiment with a number of different pressure changes, we'd find that the flows would change, and we could plot this curve, which is the autoregulatory curve. And so we have a period of time here where the tissues are not controlling things, and then they gradually have a plateau period where they control, and then we get out here again where the tissues can't regulate. And we have then a period of uh, pressures where our flow stays the same or fairly constant. So we're not changing our flow very much even though we are changing the pressure a lot. So the tissues are, are controlling it. You know, this is considered autoregulation, and they're going to change and control flow by either dilating or constricting. Now we can do this kind of study for a number of different tissues, and this shows 
first of all, the passive curve. And this shows the active autoregulatory curve for the coronary vasculature. And we could continue this down, and we'd have the same kind of curve, and how flat this is and how much autoregulation is taking place is totally dependent upon the tissue. And long-term control is, can be very tight. And so here we're looking at the kidney. And you can see that it controls its flow very, very well over a rather extensive period of pressures. The brain, again, controls autoregulates very well. The coronary has a very nice flat autoregulatory curve. Skeletal muscle is not quite as great. Now let's kind of look at this curve again. So here's a basic autoregulatory curve. This part of it is just passive, as is this. And so this part is where we have autoregulation. If you look at the vessels, here's our blood vessel. And at that point, we start increasing the pressure. So we're just going to increase the volume, or the, the radius, just by the pressure. And so as we do that, we get this passive response where the vessel is dilating. Over this period of time, even though the pressure is increasing, our radius is going down because the vessel is responding to that increased pressure and increased flow and is constricting to keep flow constant. And then we get to a point where the vessel can no longer autoregulate and so it's passively dilating again. So how do the tissues regulate their blood flow? There are two mechanisms. One is called myogenic and the other is metabolic. With the myogenic response, the muscle actively contracts or relaxes in response to the wall tension. Now I make that point because you can take a vessel out of tissue and have it being not perfused and it will still respond that way. So it's as a result of the changes in the wall tension and we'll discuss that. With a metabolic response, we have metabolites that are dilators, and they're going to cause the vessel to dilate as the metabolites are, are accumulated. So we're going to look at these two responses independently. First of all, myogenic. You have to understand that what is being controlled is the tension in the wall. And so the forces stretching or trying to tear the, part of wall, the wall apart is called wall tension. And the tension of the wall is the pressure times the radius divided by two times the wall thickness, which is shown you here. And that's the law of Laplace. So as the vessel dilates, the wall tension increases. As the pressure increases, wall tension increases. If the radius decreases, wall tension will decrease. The law of Laplace. Now let's look at that in a minute. <clears throat> we start off with an event where we have an increase in the pressure inside the vessel. The myogenic response causes the vessel to constrict, decreasing the radius, and that decreases the flow. Now that's the kind of thing that we would like to see because the flow went up here, so we had an increase in flow here, and now we have a decrease in flow here, bringing back our flow to where it should be. But the flow is not being controlled, the wall tension is. Now there are uh, calcium channels in the vessel, in the walls of the endothelium that are responsive to stretch. So if we stretch these uh, endothelial cells, open the channels, calcium comes in, Calcium then acts on the contractor mechanism within the smooth muscle and causes it to uh, contract. On the other side of that, if we have the pressure going down, as shown here, then the vessel is going to dilate. We have less calcium coming in. That dilation is going to cause the radius to go up. The increase in radius is going to cause flow to go up. So we had a drop in flow here and then flow returns. And again, it's wall tension that is being regulated. 
So when we have the pressure goes down, wall tension goes down, the vessel constricts, and that causes the wall tension to come back. Again, the important thing here is that this is a feedback system, but it's a feedback system that changes wall tension, and that is appropriate to change flow. And so that's the myogenic response for controlling blood flow. Now let's look at the metabolic response. Metabolic activity uses adenosine and oxygen and produces metabolites. All metabolites are vasodilators in the systemic circulation. Some of those metabolites that we're looking at are carbon dioxide, which also causes uh, carbonic acid, so we have a low pH. Adenosine, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Osmolality, increased osmolality, causes uh, the vessels then to dilate lactic acid. So in the periphery, oxygen itself is a vasoconstrictor. So as metabolic activity goes up, oxygen goes down. In addition, there are some vasoactive substances that are produced from the endothelium itself. The two most notable ones are nitric oxide and endothelin. Nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator, while endothelin causes vasoconstriction. And we're not going to talk about these specifically as uh, we go through this, but I want you to be aware of that. Just to give you an idea of the complexity, this represents the endothelium, and it shows the various receptors it has. It shows various substances released. It talks about renin, angiotensin. But the important thing is that there are th those that are cause vasoconstriction and those that cause vasorelaxation. But just as a general idea, in the 1960s, there were a number of people who were looking at the regulation of blood flow to the, the heart. And Rubio and Byrne came up with what they called the adenosine hypothesis, which states that as you have an increase in activity, we have ATP being used, ADP being used, and that then produces adenosine. And the adenosine then flu uh, is leaking out of the cells in the myocardium, and the adenosine acts on the coronary vasculature to cause vasodilation. Now, if you had an increase in oxygen, you're going to drive this back up, which means that you'll have a decrease in adenosine. Now, for a long time, people were trying to find out what was the single item that controlled blood flow in all of the vessels. And adenosine contributes to coronary flow regulation, but it's not the only thing. And I don't think that's true of any of the vasculature. They all respond to those metabolites that I showed. And so the regulation of blood flow in any vasculature is the summation of all of these various metabolites. Now, we have what is called active and reactive hyperemia. Hyperemia means an increase in blood flow. So if I increase activity, or the metabolic activity, which I'm doing here, we're producing metabolites, and so our blood flow goes up. And that's called active, is the result of activity. On the other hand, if I have the femoral artery here, and I have the various pressures, so this is my pressure in the femoral artery, but I suddenly drop that pressure down to zero, Here's my flow, and obviously the flow is going to go down to zero as well. When I bring the pressure back up, flow doesn't just come back to control. It sh overshoots and then comes back down. And there are a lot of things you could say that's causing that. You could say it's a result of oxygen debt, which is often used. You can say that we have accumulated metabolites that have got to be now washed out until you bring the metabolic balances back, and that probably is a very important component of that. But this period of reactive hyperemia 
again, this is reactive because it's a reaction to the occlusion, is proportional to the period of time when we had no flow. So the longer the zero flow, the greater the reactive hyperemia. And just to show you that this really does happen, this is an experiment that was done. Here's left ventricular pressure, aortic pressure, and this is coronary flow, circumflex coronary flow in a conscious dog. So we occluded the coronary artery for five seconds, and so here you can see the reactive hyperemia. We included it for 10 seconds, and again the reactive hyperemia. And then 15 seconds, and you can see that again the reactive hyperemia is proportional to the period of hypoxia. Okay, conclusion. All tissues have the ability to regulate their blood flow to some degree or another. Some are very strongly metabolic, some are very strongly myogenic. All of them have both. The important thing to understand though is that in the long term, the metabolic activity of the tissues controls cardiac output. And let me give you an example. If you have a patient who is uh, experiencing a drop in blood pressure, the autoregulatory processes for controlling blood pressure will try and bring things back up. But if that blood pressure stays down and the tissues stay hypoxic, they will begin to accumulate metabolites. And even though you can have circulating catecholamines, trying to cause that tissue to constrict, the metabolites are going to override that. So you don't want to control blood pressure in somebody who has a low blood pressure by giving vasoconstrictors because that just makes the tissues more hypoxic. And that then will put them into shock. I hope that this has been useful and give you some idea about the major mechanisms involved in the way that tissues control their blood flow or tissue autoregulation.